We want to continue this morning in a series that we started last week, just entitled, It Is What It Is, But It Doesn't Have to Be. And um, what, a, what an interesting week it has been in our country, to say the least, an interesting week and an already interesting year. And I think we're going to have some more interesting weeks and days after this. Uh, that's my prophetic prediction, um, which doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure that one out either. So it uh, should be interesting. But, you know, one of the things that we wanted to do with this whole series is to is to try to encourage us, encourage one another to take our minds off of things below and learn how to set our mind on things above. That's where stability is. That's where consistency is. That's where fellowship with the Lord comes into play that, that really prepares us to deal with anything that we might see below. And so it is what it is, but it doesn't have to be. And we are, are all familiar with this phrase, it is what it is. And um, let's see here. John, I am, boy, we're really on top. I, that's my fault. This actually is supposed to go back there. And that's the connection. Okay. <laughs> so let's try this again. Good morning. No, just kidding. <laughs> Good morning. No. So I think I can move it while they get this in place. Yeah. Um, it is what it is. We know this expression. We hear it in our society. Um, and, and really what it means is it's a challenging situation, and it can't be changed. We just got to accept it, right? Oh, well, they're doing this. They're doing that. The politicians are doing this. That My neighbor down the street. But, you know, it is what it is. You know, we say this all the time. We hear it all the time. And in, in light of the culture, it is what it is, but it doesn't have to be is is our mantra in this series. And we want to bring out some principles. And last week, just in terms of a quick review of what we covered, cover, distractions in life abound. We are so easily distracted. And I'm not even talking about sinful things as believers necessarily. I'm just talking about distractions, amoral things, things that kind of just uh, dictate and dominate what we think about, what we spend our resources on. It could be hobbies. It could be um, e even family. It can be lots of different things distracting us from what? Well, our primary purpose in life as a believer in Jesus Christ is to fulfill his will for us in life. I go back to Ephesians 2.10. God has created each one of us in Christ Jesus. Those who have put your faith in Jesus Christ and him alone and his finished work, he's created each one of us to walk in good works that he's designed for you specifically to walk in. Now, I've said this before, and I don't mean to be trite with it, but it, God has created you your own yellow brick road that he wants you to walk on. He's got good works for you along that path that he, as you are presented to him by faith, you will enter into those good works and execute them by means of the Holy Spirit. It's as simple as that. That's what life is all about. The Christian life is not about do's and don'ts. It's not about stopping this and doing this. The Christian life is walking in fellowship with the Lord, holding his hand, allowing him to lead you in life situations as you're going about life, responding to the Lord instead of reacting to situations. That's the goal. That's the whole goal. And yet Satan and the world system want to dictate and dominate what you think about, what you're occupied with. And if you don't believe me, just watch the news for a week and see what you're going to be occupied with. Just, just watch or listen to multiple podcasts a week, and you're going to, you tell me what the most important thing in life right now is. And I guarantee, and I don't care what side you listen to, they're not going to say Jesus Christ is the most important thing in your life right now. That's what the Word of God says, though. That's where we want to bring our thinking and say, you know what? I don't want to be captivated by what the world is captivated by. I don't want to be distracted by what the world wants to distract me with. I want to be cap captivated by Jesus Christ. I want to be enraptured by Jesus Christ. I want to be occupied with Jesus Christ. And this is the whole point. We looked at this a little bit last week. We need to adjust our thinking. We need to proactively set our mind on things above. The world system wants to dictate to you what you should set your mind on, what you should be doing, what you should be occupied with, what you should be spending your resources on. What are the biggest problems in the world today that's what the world system wants to occupy you with. You know what the biggest problem in the world today? 
is we're not sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. There are people who are lost and dying and going to hell. That's the number one biggest problem in our world today. And we think it's politics. And we think it's social issues. And we think it's this and that and the other thing. And to just net it down to the main mission of the Church of Jesus Christ, we are here to make disciples. We do that by evangelizing the lost and discipling the saved. That's what we're here for. And that's what our life is all about. Now, last week we looked at, I, I called it a grounding principle. Funny, because grounding ourselves by looking up. <laughs> Grounding and stabilizing ourselves of the root system by keeping our eyes set on things above. And that first grounding principle we looked at last week was this concept of personal responsibility and personal accountability. That means when we do something wrong, we own it. That means when somebody does something wrong to us, rather than trying to make it them do something right, we sweep in front of our front porch. We react or respond to even mistreatment in the right way, not justifying wrong behavior because somebody has mistreated us. And then just this mindset that even in fellowship with the Lord, that we have this mechanism that God has put in place that when we sin as believers, and we will sin as believers, it's not that we encourage people to sin, we just recognize the reality of the fact that we will sin as believers. John recognizes that in 1 John. And so he names a mechanism by which each one of us can be restored to fellowship with the Lord, and it's called confession of sin. And that's owning our sin. That's taking personal responsibility in, in a very specific way, that when we got angry with this person, anger is wrong, and we simply confess that to the Lord. It has everything to do with personal responsibility and accountability. We want to build on that this week. The second grounding principle we want to look at this morning is not only what is our personal responsibility and accountability, but what is our personal responsibility to other people? Where, because if you listen to the world, they will be willing to tell you where your personal responsibility and accountability lies. I, there used to be a, a, a Messianic Jewish teacher, and he used to, to joke all the time. He said, you know, I believe that the church should be supporting you know, Jewish ministries, you know, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And then he would say, and if you need to know of a good Jewish ministry to support, I can suggest one. You know, and it looks like he's, he's doing something for his own benefit here. But what we're talking about here is simply this. What is your responsibility to others? What does God say is your responsibility to others? How do you know what the difference is? There's lots of good things out there, right? Lots of good causes to throw your weight behind. But where does God want you occupied with? In fact, I would venture to say that much of what the world puts forward as things that we should throw our weight behind and give our resources to completely distract from the primary thing that Jesus Christ wants to accomplish in your life. And yet they look like good things. They look like positive things. So Jesus was posed a question 2,000 years ago. He answers it masterfully. Sean read it for us earlier. Turn with me to Luke chapter 10. And we want to look at this story. We know it as the Good Samaritan story. I think it should be titled The Good Neighbor, because that's really what the, the, the answer that Jesus gives is, is an answer to that question. Who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? How can I, maybe we can put it this way, how can I be neighborly? From God's perspective, this is what we're going to look at this morning, but to kind of set the stage, there's this little intro into this question. And in verse 25, we read this, and behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him saying, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now, one of the things we got to understand, this is a pretty common question in Jesus' day amongst the religious leaders, uh, the, the ones especially who studied the law. Okay, remember, remember a lawyer is somebody that studies the law, but in, but in Jewish life, what law were they studying? It was the Mosaic law, okay? They're studying the, the Word of God, the Old Testament, the Pentateuch. That's what they're studying here. So this was a common theological question of the day. This is a question that uh, rabbis and scribes and lawyers would spend hours debating, okay? So they're like, all right, we got Jesus here. He's supposed to be this, this teacher. Let's check out what his answer is, all right? And so, again, the lawyer in Jesus' day was 
an expert, someone who was a professional relating to the Mosaic law. And as we look at his question, I don't know if you picked that up in verse 25, but he says this, the lawyer stood up and tested him. And immediately, because we know, like, the end of the story, what they do with Jesus, you know, they crucify him, they, they persecute him, we, we automatically think, man, he, this is, like, uh, bad motives. Like, he's testing him, you know, he's trying to trick him. And automatically, we might assume that. What's interesting is that word itself doesn't necessarily imply hostility, not necessarily. He's just checking on Jesus's understanding. He wants to see if Jesus has some, some input that could solve this question for all. But where we do pick up some hostility is if you jump down to verse 29, after Jesus answers his question, notice that first phrase, but he wanting to justify himself. So we pick, we, there is some hostility here. There is some impure motives from this man. And then we also see that his question um, kind of reveals a little bit more about him because it's interesting because he combines the word inherit with do. Now, very, that's a very subtle point, but when we talk about inheritance, we're talking about being an heir. We're talking about somebody who receives a possession or a benefit from someone who has died. Typically, that right is, is gained from a parent. Inheritance often, though, has nothing to do with what a child does. It's, a, it's almost a family birthright that when mom and dad die, the child's just going to get it. Now, I get it. You know, you don't want to be an idiot and lose the inheritance. I mean, some kids do that. They almost work their way out of an inheritance. But typically, there's not something you have to do or perform to get an inheritance. And so you see, even on the outset, there's some confusion on this question. There's some confusion. In fact, notice what he assumes. Notice what this man assumes by even asking this question. Number one, he assumes he's a child of God. Because you don't use the word inheritance unless you're a child. You don't assume that you'll have an inheritance unless you're part of the family. And this makes sense because every Jewish circumcised male would have assumed this. They would have assumed, in fact, the, the, the thought of the day is I'm a child of Abraham. I'm circumcised. I'm in. Very simply put, my natural birth is what dictates my entrance into the kingdom. And this is why when Jesus talked to Nicodemus, he blew his mind. He said, Nicodemus, you got to be born again. You got to be born from above. And Nicodemus is like, what do you, I mean, what do you mean? I'm a son of Abraham. I'm circumcised. I'm a rabbi. I've got all this religious pedigree. I'm a teacher among teachers. And you're saying that I'm lacking something to get into the kingdom. And Jesus said, yep, you are a spiritual birth from above that only God can enact when you put your faith in the promised deliverer whose name is Jesus Christ, who delivered you by dying for your sins and rising again. That's what he was telling Nicodemus. So this guy assumes he's a child of God. He, he, he assumes incorrectly because he, he thinks that this inheritance is something he must earn as indicated by a second assumption. He's got to do something to receive his inheritance. So we're setting the stage for the question because we're setting the stage for the way Jesus answers the question. So he assumes he's got a performance mindset. And when Jesus gives the answer, it's just an incredible answer. In fact, we're going to pick up three verses here as we read through verses 26 through 28. He said to him, what is written in the law? What is your reading of it? So he answered and said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered rightly, do this and you will live. And so Jesus takes him to the word of God for his answer. In fact, he throws the question back at him. What do you understand from the word of God? And the guy says, well, you got to uh, basically do these two things. And you know what? He answered correctly. He gave Jesus the correct theological answer to the question, love God, love your neighbor. In fact, we learn from other scriptures that this is a summary of the entire Mosaic law, these two commands. In fact, Orthodox Jews in this, in this day, they, they recited these commands before they even left the house in the morning. Every single day, these were two of the things that they recited. The, the Shema, great, you know, hero Israel, the Lord our God is one. That was something they recited. But these two commands were also something they recited. So it's right on the tip of his tongue. He knows the correct theological answer here. And Jesus basically says, you know what? You got it right. If you do that, 
you live. Now, it's interesting because the, the word do this is a present tense command. Jesus says, yeah, if you do this and continually do this is kind of the idea. If you do this perfectly. In fact, if any human being could do these two commands perfectly, guess what they would earn? They would each earn eternal life. And we don't have time to go there, but if you want to jot this down, Romans chapter 2, verses 5 through 8, Romans chapter 2, verses 5 through 8, Paul uses a similar argument here. And basically what he says is, if there is a man, woman, or child who can live consistently and perfectly, keeping the law of God, guess what? God will be a fair judge, and he'll grant them eternal life. He'll give it to them as a reward. But then... Paul goes on to make the conclusion in chapter 3. And what does he say in chapter 3? There's none righteous, no, no one. There's none that seeks after God. There's none that does good. In other words, if there was a person that ever existed that could do this, and by the way, there's not, God would be fair and give them eternal life because they would have earned heaven. But this is the, the point of the Bible. And this is, I believe, the point of Jesus' answer is to get this guy's attention by saying, you're not that guy. You're not that guy. If you did this, yeah, you could live, but that's not what it's all about. So he gives him actually more law, I believe, to convict him that he doesn't measure up to this standard. In fact, what we're going to see is the guy gets it because what's he going to do? He's going to try to justify himself. What's the word justify mean? declare himself righteous. See, he, he wants to declare himself righteous, good enough to go to heaven, so he's missing the point. In fact, Jesus goes on to say, you will live. And this verb, because of the form, it can be either middle or active voice, but the point is this, the man chose to live this type of life, and he secured eternal life by the way he lived. If you do this, if you continually do this, you will secure for yourself eternal life. This is what Jesus is saying to him, and this is why I believe he answers him the way that he does. Now, look as we go on in verse 29. He, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And so immediately we get some insight in this guy's motive. He's trying to skirt around the command, okay? Typical lawyer, typical lawyer, trying to find a loophole. Isn't that what he's doing? He's like, he wants a loophole here. The, the command is clear, and he's going to say, ah, oh, yeah, but let's define the terms. There was a famous guy that wanted the definition. Remember this guy on the stand? I forget his name. Just kidding, I don't. But on the stand, he wanted the definition of the word is. Remember that guy? Speaking of a political week, <laughs> this is what lawyers do. They want to redefine the terms. They want to limit the command. They want to limit the law. They want to know what their limits are. They want to know how far they can push up against it. He wanted to justify himself. In other words, he wanted to declare or to convince others that he was righteous. That's what self-justification does. And see, this is the problem with religious people. They care more about how others view them than how God views them. So he actually comes out with a good question because he's going to get God's standard on this question, whether he wants it or not. He's just trying to limit, I believe, his responsibility here. In fact, as one commentator said, he said, realize, this guy realized the only way he could fulfill the law's demands was to limit its demands. Only way he could do it. So he's trying to do that to Jesus. And, and so it's from this impure and selfish motive that we move into this story that Jesus now tells to answer this question, who is my neighbor? And um, this is the question. And, and what's really on, ironic is the word neighbor is really not hard to define. Okay, it's, it's, this guy's asking for clarification on the word like is. I mean, it's pretty easy to define. It's pretty easy to know. It just means someone who's nearby. And, and you know, to be fair, you know, we, we like to read back and kind of sometimes we're unfair to people in the Bible. But to be fair, it, you know, it's an understandable question from a religious Jew in Jesus' day. Who's my neighbor? Did it only include Jews? Do I... Do I bump over into Samaria where they're, they're half Jew, half Gentile, or, or do I even have to include Gentiles in that? What's, what is God? How does God view this? And I believe this is the, the question. What would God's standard be 
to this question. Who indeed is a neighbor biblically? And this is, I believe, all of this is coming out. And so Jesus is now going to tell a story. And what it's going to illustrate for us this morning is this principle of our responsibility to other people. And so let's kind of get into this. Setting the stage, verse 30, Jesus sets the stage for the story. And he answered and said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. He fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, departed, leaving him half dead. And so we have the stage set. We see the story. A, a certain man came down from Jerusalem to Jericho. And notice, first of all, Jesus doesn't identify the ethnicity of this man. He doesn't say a Jewish man came down, a Samaritan man came down, a Gentile. He just said a certain man. And I think he does that for a reason. He's going to insert some ethnicity here in a second, but it's not the way we, the, his audience would have thought it would have gone. Okay, but he doesn't do that. He doesn't identify him. So this guy could have been a Jew, a Gentile, Samaritan, didn't matter who he was, didn't matter who he was for the purpose of the story. One of the things we learn about this road from Jerusalem down to Jericho is it was a very famous road in this day because it was a desert road about 17 to 20 miles that descended about 3,300 feet. Talk about a hike. Okay, you're, you're changing elevation quite a bit. Maybe get your gum out, you know, so your ears don't pop kind of deal. So he's descending from high up. He's descending down to Jericho. And one of the things we learn about this road in history, it was a very treacherous road. It was a winding road. And it became a favorite location of robbers. They would had many places to hide, and they could attack somebody when they least expected it. In fact, one commentator said this was one of the most dangerous roads in all of antiquity, if you can put it in perspective. So Jesus is giving a great parable, right? Parables are, are stories designed to come alongside truth and illustrate the truth. So very real story, very probable that this could happen. In fact, I've got a picture of the road just it's a topographical map here. Here's Jerusalem. You can kind of see this wind through the mountains down to Jericho. Um, so you can kind of get a picture of that. And then here's a picture of two men walking on that road today. And you can just see some areas where robbers could hide, get them around the corner where nobody can see what's going on. And you've got the recipe for a very dangerous pathway to go. And this is the pathway that Jesus uses. And so he sets the stage. There was a violent confrontation. In fact, he says this man fell among thieves. It means he was surrounded by them. And then we see the thieves did three things in verse 30. First of all, they stripped him of his clothing. And you're like, well, well, that's weird. That's an odd thing to do for a thief. But in this day, clothing was, was the most valuable asset that somebody had on their person. It would be equivalent to a robber stealing a man's wallet today. That's the, that's the concept that's communicated. But also very embarrassing. I mean, you're stripped out of your clothes. I mean, that, that probably doesn't help much either. But that's why they stripped him of his clothes. Valuable asset. Clothing was a valuable asset. This is why they did it. Apparently, this man may have fought back. We don't know that. The text doesn't tell us. But it says that they wounded him. He may have fought back when confronted by the thieves, and then they, they put a shellacking on him, you know, as they used to say. I mean, they, they hurt him. They hurt him. In fact, the word wounded is a, is a compound word in the Greek. It means to, to put on or lay upon many blows or strikes. They beat him. They just flat out beat him. And they beat him so bad that when they left him, he was almost dead. It was almost a fatal beating. So this kind of sets the stage for the story. A very, very tragic situation, very um, upsetting situation. I, I still remember my middle school days and, and being in the hallway when a group of people uh, jumped a guy right in the middle of the hallway. It's the worst thing I've ever experienced. You know, it's, it just, uh, to me, it was just, I, and there's so many going on that in, in middle school, you know, a lot of times you don't stand for anything. You just kind of stand off to the side. But looking back, I wish I would have jumped in and protected this guy. He got beat up pretty good. It was the worst thing I'd ever seen. And so it, that's kind of the imagery you've got here. These, this group of robbers just left him half dead and beat the living tar out of him. And so now Jesus sets the stage. He's going to give us three responses. And why does he give us these three different men? Because he's answering the question, what? Who's my neighbor? How, how can you be neighborly? And so our first responder says this, 
In verse 31, now by chance, a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Now, here's what's ironic. I mentioned it earlier. The first two responders we're going to look at were Orthodox Jewish men who would have quoted the very verses that the lawyer quoted every morning before they left the house. So this man we're about to look at would have had these words from the Word of God on his lips before he leaves the house, and now he's confronted with the situation to actually practice the truth that he knows. And so let's see what he does. You, you know the story. We've read the verse, and uh, we see that he's a, a priest. Uh, it means he was a Levitical priest. That means he, he probably served in the temple. In fact, if he's coming from Jerusalem back to Jericho, he may have just served in the temple. It might have been his rotation in the temple. So holy man, right? Man of God, we would say, the, the culture would say. So how does he respond here? Well, the text tells us he happened upon the situation by chance. He wasn't expecting it. It was a coincidence of circumstances that he even saw this guy. And, and what that tells us is this, and we want to build on this later. He didn't plan for this to happen. He didn't, this had not been worked into his schedule by his secretary. He didn't know that he was going to be confronted with this. It was inconvenient for him. Obviously, he's walking. He's probably headed somewhere. And so all of this plays in to the point that he wasn't prepared for it. And so what does he do? Well, the text tells us he, he came down. Um, again, it tells us probably just speaks more to his normal path of route and during his normal walk on his normal ro road, he stumbles upon this half-dead man. And he begins to assess the situation. In fact, look at, uh, look at verse uh, 31. It, it, it's that word saw. And we're going to see that used by every responder. They're going to see him. And it's more than just, oh, they caught a glance of him. It means they looked over and they tried to assess the situation. They tried to figure out what was going on. You know, I don't know if you've ever done that before. Um, where maybe you're, you're walking, uh, you see, I remember, I remember we were driving in uh, Gatlinburg like a few years ago, and I was kind of down the road, and I saw out in the distance, and I saw this, this dark uh, figure kind of coming into the, uh, dark figure on four legs coming into the roadway, but it was probably like a half a mile up, and I was like, oh man, someone's dog's out, you know? And, I, and as I got closer, it wasn't a dog, it was a bear. <laughs> it's a bear on this, on this road. And, um, but you, you know, sometimes you, you see something you think it is, and then you kind of study a little bit more and like, oh man, that's not what I thought it was. And so these, these men are assessing the situation. They're looking at this man. They're trying to figure out what's going on. And so he, he sees him, meaning he saw with perception. In other words, he evaluated it and saw it correctly. In other words, there's a half dead man lying on the side of the road. He knew that. It wasn't like he just kind of glanced over there and then took off. But as a result of his assessment, and this is where he pick up, he passed by on the other side. In other words, he completely ignored him. He stopped to render aid. He didn't help him. He probably, like many people, thought, I'm just not going to get involved. I just, I don't even want to get involved. <laughs> I, don't even, I don't know what's going on over there. I don't know what happened to him, but I am not going to get involved. And so that's our first responder. Our second responder, verse 32, says, likewise... A Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked, passed by on the other side. Again, this Levite would have been an Orthodox Jewish man. He may not have been functioning as a priest. Jesus doesn't identify him as that way, but he may have assisted priests in their function. And the text tells us that he arrived at, or he came to the position of the half-dead men. And when he did that, he did two things. Uh, he came, meaning he came over closer. So this guy actually sees him. He comes over to inspect a little bit more. He assesses the situation. And when he assesses it, guess what he does? He evaluated it again with perception. And then he had the same exact response. He goes to the other side of the road and keeps going. Passes right by him. Didn't get involved. And now we have a third responder. And this is where the story gets really interesting because of the, the character that Jesus picks. He doesn't pick a Levite. He doesn't pick a priest. He doesn't pick a Pharisee. He doesn't pick a Sadducee. He doesn't pick somebody from the religious elite or somebody that you would expect to do the right thing. He picks a Samaritan. 
And his audience must have just been gritting their teeth, biting their lip, blood boiling within them, listening to this story because they know he's about to set this guy up as the hero of the story. And so we're going to see that here in verses 33 through 35, this third responder. But a certain Samaritan, verse 33 says, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him, bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, took care of him. And on the next day when he departed, he took out two uh, denarii, gave them to the innkeeper and said to him, take care of him and whatever more you spend when I come again, I will repay you. So I mentioned this, this would have immediately, introducing a Samaritan here, would have immediately conjured up prejudice from Jesus's audience. Why is that? Well, they were half Jew, half Gentile products. If you remember, the northern kingdom of Israel were taken into captivity by the Assyrians, and then the Assyrians um, eventually started repopulating the area of Samaria with these exiled Jews, but forcing them to mix with their own. And so they were a half breed, if you will, half Jew, half Gentile. And we even see in Jesus's day that they were despised by the Jews. In fact, if you had to go north or south, oftentimes they would just go all the way around Samaria so they would not have to even go through it. That's what makes the story in John 4 so incredible. Jesus in meeting with this woman at the, at the well, meeting with a Samaritan woman of all things, not just a Samaritan man, but a woman, and that was even viewed worse and yet, he, and yet God cares about the individual. What a, what a great story in and of itself. But it just kind of puts perspective into this. And, and so what's crazy is Jesus is now going to set up a Samaritan as the hero of the story. He's going to set up a Samaritan as the one who lives out God's word. Not the religious elite, not the ones who can quote large portions of the Old Testament, but but the man who actually lives it out in, in flesh, loving his neighbor as himself. In fact, we see his introduction to the situation is a lot like the, the first priest. The, he, he's on his way somewhere. He, he, as he journeyed, the text tells us, and then he notices a half dead man. And then he responded in the following ways. Notice the similarities, but also notice the differences. And notice also, too, this also was not part of his plan day or schedule. Uh, we kind of see that in the way that he responds because he gets this half-beaten man settled for the night, but then what does he do the next morning? He has to get on about his business. So this wasn't a convenient thing. It wasn't like he had a day off from work and he's like, okay, I'm, I'm off. It's convenient. I can take care of this. And that's how oftentimes these opportunities come into our life. They are not convenient. They don't happen on your day off. They don't happen when you have two hours to kill. You know, people joke all the time that with me, so, you know, I'll, uh, like when I finished a degree, they would say, well, what are you going to do with all your free time? And I'm like, free time? What's that? With five kids? I mean, it's already filled. I don't know what it's going to be filled with, but it is already filled. We know that. So it wasn't like this guy just was like wandering aimlessly and had two hours to kill. This would have been an inconvenience to his schedule too, but notice how he responds. He came to where he was, just like the second man, the Levite. He comes to the man. He comes over and gets a better look. But we're going to see his ultimate response is different. His second response, he saw him. He also evaluated the situation. He assessed it. But again, we're going to see that his final response is different than the previous two men. Because what do the other two men do at this point? Cut and run. Let me get on the... Not only that, they don't just walk away from him. What do they do? They cross the road. I mean, look at the imagery that Jesus is giving. They don't even want anything to do with this. They cross the road to go by him, right? It's, it's giving us this imagery. This man, though, the text tells us, had compassion on the man. Interesting word he uses there because the word itself means bowels, like your gut. And that might be disgusting, but when you're talking about feeling something for somebody and you say, I feel it from my gut. If you've ever had butterflies before, you know, those of you that are married, you know how that feels. You know how that, that feels, that, that guttural, internal, where, where you can, it, it, the feelings are palpable, right? Um, he felt compassionately for this man, deep, 
visceral compassion. In fact, the word itself is, is only used 12 times in the New Testament, eight times it's used of Jesus Christ. One time it's used here, and another time it's used that it's not Jesus Christ. It's still reflecting Jesus Christ because it talks about the father of the prodigal son and how he felt when he saw his son coming down the road. This guttural, internal compassion toward the situation. This is what's so incredible about this word. I also have a note there, which I think is just, uh, just fascinating because What's interesting about the, the verb that Jesus uses here is he indicates that this response, this compassion, came upon the Samaritan from an outside source. It's a passive voice in the Greek. So what that means is this, either due to seeing the circumstances, this compassion acted upon him and he extended it to the man, or God used those circumstances where God moved him toward compassion. Either way, I believe this man was in fellowship with the Lord. He was responding to what God was placing into his heart to respond to this man in such a way. So just in, incredible as we get into the details here. And so in going back to the commandment to love your neighbor as yourself, it makes perfect sense. Because when bad things happen to you, do you tend to have strong feelings toward that? Is that kind of a natural response? You, you really are, I mean, we, there's so many times where we get self-pity mode. We feel sorry for ourselves. feel like we've been mistreated, mishandled, misspoken to. We have no, no one needs to coach us how to feel bad for ourselves. No one needs to coach us or teach us how to feel compassion for ourselves, right? And so it's so interesting because in the same way that we do that for ourselves, God would have us also respond that way to others. This is the whole point, I believe, of this story. And so on the basis of this compassion, we see the Samaritan continues to act. How does he act? Well, the text tells us he went to him. He came to look and assess the situation earlier. Now that he has, he comes closer because now he's going to act on that compassion. He needs to be there hands on to do this. And so he comes closer. We see that he bandaged his wounds by pouring on oil and wine and so the Samaritan cleaned, dressed his wounds with the medicine available to him. They, they say oil would have soothed his wounds, whereas, whereas the wine would have disinfected them. So he basically breaks out his first aid kit and starts treating him. Or quite frankly, in that day, it was not only medicine, it was also a way to celebrate. So he might have been taking his party supplies, you know, at home, and he had a, a big feast planned for his family, and he used that to take care of this this uh, wounded man instead. It says he set him on his own animal. He, he took his animal and he, he walked. He, he got down and he walked. He put this man on his animal and led the animal to a position of safety. He didn't ride it or drag the guy behind him, right? He put him on top of his animal to care for him. And then we see that he brought him to an inn and took care of him. And not only did he care for him, but he did what the, the text tells us. It says that he stayed with him throughout the night. He cared for him. He, he stayed with him. He cared for him throughout the night. He provided lodging for him. And then what did he do? We, he paid the innkeeper to continue caring for him. He had to go about his business, but he said, look, here's two denarii, the, probably a, a couple of days wages. He, he gives to this man and he says, take, take care of this guy. And, and oh, by the way, if I didn't give you enough, and I don't come back within a couple days, I'm good for whatever else you have to spend. You, just, you put that on my account, I'll take care of it when I get back. And you see the action very clearly. We see now, as we look back in our text, verse 35, the story's over. Real quick story, real easily understandable story. Let's see if the lesson was learned. So which one loved his neighbor? Jesus says in verse 36, which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And so he's using this story to drive home his point. Uh, notice too, by the way, just in terms of making some application here in a minute, notice too that, that none of these men live next door to the man who had fallen amongst thieves. You know, it's just, the, the mindset of neighbor, that it's, gotta, it's just the two families that live on the other side of us, we need to just erase that from our thinking. That's not, when God talks about loving your neighbor, that's not what he's talking about. Just, it's not limited to the two houses next door, 
right? So none of these people lived next to this guy. So what is, what is a neighbor? Well, we'll look at that here in a second. Does the guy get the answer right? We'll look at verse 37. He gets the answer right. And he said, he who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. And so we see that this lawyer answered correctly. But you know what? As the case was before, he answers it in a very interesting way. Just, just some quick observations. Just fascinating the way uh, he says this. And the first observation is this. Notice that the lawyer uses the word mercy and not compassion like Jesus used. Isn't that something? Now you say, well, what's, what's the difference? Well, the difference is not much, but it's subtle. <laughs> and, and the difference speaks to this gentleman's motivation, I believe, because it, it's interesting. Jesus doesn't use mercy in the story. What does Jesus use? Compassion. He uses that he's moved to compassion, and it's as a result of that compassion that he does all of these things. So why does this guy switch to mercy? Well, interesting, they're almost synonymous, but mercy also reflects what? Mercy, if we, if we know the distinction of mercy, mercy reflects the negative idea of not getting what you deserve. And couldn't you just see a legalist look at this man who's half beaten and said, yeah, he probably got what he deserved. It, that's exactly what Job's friends said, right? Oh yeah, Job, Job come on, dude. Just admit it. <laughs> What'd you do wrong? God doesn't treat people. What'd you do wrong? You probably got what you deserved. It's really fascinating because he's the one that brings out mercy. Whereas, and in contrast, it, mercy is not getting what you do deserve, and grace is what? Getting something you don't deserve. That, that's even the contrast between mercy and grace. Those sometimes seem synonymous. But he doesn't say compassion. He says, he who showed mercy on him. He who gave that guy something he didn't deserve. <laughs> In fact, what would, what, would have, what would have this lawyer done? He, I mean, if he would have helped, he probably would have took the guy into town and like dropped him at the hospital and said, good luck, dude. I've been neighborly, right? So it's interesting he says that. Then what's really interesting is he doesn't say the Samaritan. He you know, Jesus says, okay, we've got a priest, we've got a Levite, and we've got a Samaritan. And how does he answer the question? Okay, so who showed mercy? Oh, he, that, that dude, your, your third example. But he won't allow the word Samaritan to touch his lips, to give this guy credit to be the hero in the story. What's really ironic is how did the lawyer actually know that the Samaritan showed mercy? The only reason he knew is because of what he could see through the story. The hands-on actions revealed that this man had responded, basically, to the Lord. And so Jesus says, go and do likewise. And that really just kind of brings us to um, the application here as it relates to responsibility to others. And so the first application, uh, I think, is this. Who is your neighbor? And I think if we could just simply put it, it's whoever's in your path. Whoever is in your path that has a need. And you know, one of the things that, that's interesting is as you put the word of God together and you start to take this puzzle piece and this puzzle piece and this puzzle piece, I, I believe if we understand the Bible correctly in, in, in so much as the way the Lord wanted to give it to us, those puzzle pieces should fit together. They should come together like a hand in glove. And it's really interesting to, to notice this concept because what's the whole concept of the Great Commission? Well, make disciples, but do it what? As you are going. And, and isn't that exactly what the Samaritan did? As he journeyed, here's this opportunity to present himself. He dives in. He responds. It's right there. I love what Haddon Robinson said, who is a teacher of preachers. He said this, your neighbor, about this whole section, he said, your neighbor is any person whose need you see and whose need God put you in a position to meet. I like that definition. Simple hits home. And, and you know, what's really fascinating about this is we are told to live lives presented to the Lord as those who are alive from the dead. We're, we're constantly by faith presenting our members, the members of our body to the Lord. 
and we want to allow him to guide and direct us into the works he's designed for us. You know, too many believers are out trying to just stir up activities of good works. And if we would just simply occupy ourselves with Jesus Christ and present ourselves by faith to him, he wants to lead you into the good works that he's got designed for you. You don't have to make them up or create them on your own. In fact, if, if I were to give you the option, you could go out and do a day's worth of good works that will be wasted, that won't be rewarded at the Bema Seat of Christ, or you can wake up in the morning, every morning, occupy yourself with Jesus Christ, present yourself to the Lord and say, Lord, I'm here, I'm available, what do you have for me today? And you actually walk by faith and just respond to what the Lord put in your path. Which one would you take? Well, for many of us, we're too bent on having a list. We're too bent on crossing stuff off our list, making a plan, sticking to our plan. We've got no room for the flexibility of the Lord, maybe interrupting that plan. Maybe, you know, maybe God say, hey, I'm sorry, I actually had something else in mind for you today. Not that he would need to apologize. But he, he inserts himself oftentimes like that, and we just take it at this, as this big interruption, as this just this incredible inconvenience Oh, why is, that, why is that person calling me today? Of all days, the worst day possible, I'll just call them back in three days. I'll call them back when I get free. And you see, God wants to lead us and guide us if we'll simply walk by faith and present our bodies to him as living sacrifices. You know, the other thing I think we can gather, application point, we're not going out and looking for all the bruised and beaten people in the world. That's not what this parable teaches. And, you know, oftentimes, um, this is a scheme of Satan to distract you with everything else out there so you don't see the things right here. And I love, I love what a commentator said. He said, this is a subtle and yet demonic arithmetic in the church. We see millions, but we do not see the individual. He says, this type of arithmetic will cross seas but it won't cross the street. And, and you see, we, we can get caught up into this. We can get caught up in the way that the, the media and our world system want to drive social issues in our thinking as the primary thing that we, and they want us to focus on these millions of people out here, and we miss out day to day on what God has got for you right here in Noonan, Georgia, right on your path. And it's It's tragic. That's a principle. We're not looking for bruised and beaten people up over the world. As a believer in Jesus Christ, we're presented to the Lord, and we're responding to things that are on our path. You know, there are plenty of neighbors locally and in our lives that we do not need to hopscotch and jump over other believers to their neighbors. This is what's so incredible. In fact, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1. Just a a little nugget tucked, tucked in right there at the end of Ephesians chapter 1. Talking about the church of Jesus Christ. And he, and he says this. And he, uh, speaking of God the Father, put all things under his feet, Jesus Christ. And he gave him to be head over all things to the church. Look at this. Which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all. All in all. You know what's really fascinating about that verse is because when Jesus tells his disciples right before he's going to leave, he says, it's good for you that I go away. It's good for you that I go away. I, I would have been like his disciples. No, Jesus, I want you to stay forever. Like, I, I just want to walk with you forever. I just want to live my life just hanging out with you, right? Is this going to be better for you? Why? Because when Jesus was on earth, guess where he was? If he was in Jerusalem, guess where he was? Not a trick question. He was in Jerusalem. And if he was in Samaria, guess where he was? Again, not a trick question. He's in Samaria, right? But when Jesus goes, he sends back his spirit to indwell believers. Now guess where Jesus can be? Everywhere a believer is. And thus he can fill. He can fill all in all. And you see, if we get so distracted by out there, guess what we're doing? We're leaving a hole right here. And it goes back to what is our responsibility? Who is our neighbor? Again, Who's on your path? Who do you, whose needs do you have the ability to meet? That's your neighbor. That's our area of personal responsibility. Another principle, it costs resources to be a neighbor. We saw this with the Samaritan. Both time, energy, money all come into play. 
in this story. So it's not always convenient. Fourth principle in terms of application is we need to carefully evaluate. This is very important. So many people are so merciful, they jump into every situation they can get their hands on. They see a hurting person, they're like, they're, I'm in. <laughs> I don't even think about it. But notice, too, there's still an evaluation. Even with the Good Samaritan, he still comes in, he takes a careful look. I don't, we weren't there, but he also knew that this was a dangerous road. Maybe he looked around. Maybe this wasn't a beaten man. Maybe this was a robber posing as a beaten man to where I'm now going to get jumped and beat. And so he's assessing the situation. There's, there's, a, there's an intelligent approach into this, not just jumping or getting involved with everything that we see. And so it's just there's a, a, a carefulness there. And let me just jump ahead to the last um, point, last application point, we'll close. You know, this is what we have to remember. The primary mission of the local church will never change. We, we have to cement that in our mind. Many people want to take the church. Society wants to take the church. Media wants to take the church. And they want to dictate to us what should be important to us and where we should spend our resources and time. And I'm just here to tell you, the Word of God doesn't want you to adjust your focus in that thinking. Mission of the church was given 2,000 years ago. It hasn't changed. It is to make disciples. It's to make future disciple makers. It's to preach the gospel. That's our mission. That doesn't change. And yet, what you're going to see is over time, and we see it now, we're going to see it just go on. It's gone on in every day in human history. The world system, under the sway of Satan, is trying to conform and mold and shape and force you to focus and occupy yourself with things that the Lord Jesus doesn't want you to occupy yourself with. Now, I'm not saying don't be informed, but there's, a, there's a, a line we cross between being informed and crossing over where it dominates our thinking. And that's what we want to recognize. And so just remember, we are not hopscotching all over the world looking for bruised and beaten people. That's not our primary mission. But on a day-to-day -day basis, as we're presented with the Lord, there are going to be opportunities to meet needs of people on our path, and we should respond to the Lord, recognizing that may be a good work that He wants us to walk in. And so let's close right there with a word of prayer. Lord, thanks um, for this morning. Thank you for this passage. It's um, a, a, just a good reminder, and there's Really, so many other things we could probably unpackage there, but we'll just uh, we'll leave it at that, and uh, we just trust your spirit to illuminate that passage for each one um, in terms of understanding how this plays out or works out in our daily life and thinking. And as always, may we be um, just convinced more and more that we need to be occupied with Jesus Christ, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.